Hey everyone, my name is Vince Gellman. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited to create this video. It's a topic that I have been thinking about for a good while. I've been reflecting on it. Free will versus free choice. What does that mean? I, as some of you know, I work very closely with Ascended Masters, such as Isis, um, Mary Magdalene, Kuan Yin, and others. And I have spent so much time talking to them about the nature of free will. What is free will exactly? There are so many different opinions out there on what free will is and exactly how much do we have. It's been something that has perplexed me it has troubled me and it has drawn my curiosity um, deeper and deeper into, into it, into the context of free will and what exactly it is. And, um, and again, yeah, how much do we have? How much do we have in this very troubled world? So One of the things that really helped me was a few years ago, I was meditating and suddenly a voice came to me and I'm assuming it was my higher self. And it said, you have free will, but you don't have free choice. You have free will, but you don't have free choice. And that one statement, that one truth opened the doors for me. It helped me to, to see things more clearly. And how does that feel for you when I say we have free will, but we don't have free choice? I think it, it really helps to um, allow for both the absolute realm of reality and the relative realm of reality, the absolute realm of pure spirit. And the relative realm of this earth, it allows room for both. It creates room for both. Because if we just simply talk about free will and we apply that to this earth realm, this very troubling, traumatized, limiting, confusing earth realm, and we apply free will, there's confusion because people are like, well, I don't feel very free. I don't feel free when I'm being programmed and traumatized and abused and mind controlled and where the dark forces control so much of the world's wealth and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, of course, that totally makes sense. And that's been part of my dilemma. So if we can hold things from the viewpoint that there's absolute reality or truth, and then there's the relative reality and relative truth, then it helps to hold um, it helps us to explore free will more fully and how it's different from free choice. So what is free will and how is it different from free choice? Let's dive into this really juicy topic. Um, so free will is the nature of our, our soul. It's the nature of our higher self we are by our very nature free and what does that mean well it means that the divine mother of all life prime creator god however you wish to call our source she birthed us in her exact image and likeness on all measures not just some but all measures so what that means is that we are a perfect mirror a perfect fractal, a perfect hologram of her and her creative powers. So that means just as the divine mother of all life, God, can create species, plants, planets, stars, galaxies, and even universes, we too have the exact power to create that. We have the exact same power to create as she does on all measures without exception. And that's very difficult to digest. It's hard to imagine ourselves as that powerful. 
but it even says that in Genesis, that we are made in the image and likeness of God. Although Christianity created a God that's in the image and likeness of man, so that's an inversion. <laughs> but we are made in the image and likeness of God. We are perfect reflections of God. So, so that means we are limitless in our creative power. We're limitless. We, there's nothing that we can't create because it's, our potential is infinite. It's without end, without bounds. The second thing, that, that is one of the great um, inheritances, one, one of the great divine inheritances that, that we have. But the second piece is, is that we can also understand free will from the perspective of the Divine Mother or God not stopping us from creating what we want. She doesn't interfere with our choices. She's not a helicopter parent. She's not hovering and saying, well, you can create that, but not that. You can go down that road, but that one is not allowed. You're not allowed to go down that dark road. <laughs> You'll notice that God doesn't exactly step in and stop this planet from experiencing horrors, from experiencing its hell realm, the deep evils occurring on planet and beneath its surface in the various underground bases that the dark forces have. So the Divine Mother does not interfere. If you look at the word interfere, it's inter-F-E-A-R, not just F-E-R-E. -E. It's interfere. She's not interested in fear. She's interested in love. And love means I'm not going to interfere. I'm going to allow you to explore your free will in all directions, exploring all possibilities, up, down, left, right, dark, and light. She doesn't stop us. So that is an expression of her unconditional love, is that she's given us full freedom to explore as we wish, to create as we wish, to experience the full spectrum of life as we choose. So that's two ways to understand free will, is one, we are made in the exact image and likeness of God, and we thus have the capacity to create at the exact same level as God. And number two, God does not interfere with our choices. God does not have an agenda for us. <laughs> God doesn't have a, an agenda. She's not attached to us doing things a certain way. <laughs> She's open to all ways, all ways. So now let's move from absolute to relative. So then we incarnate, we come into form, we come into a world like this, and suddenly we're not able to, to choose everything that we want. Now I'm gonna, I need to go a little bit down the road of semantics with you <laughs> because Technically, we can choose whatever we want. Technically, we have free choice. But and I'm being very exact here because I'm a bit of a wordsmith. We can choose whatever we want. A person in prison can choose to go to Barbados for the weekend. They can choose it with their words, with their thoughts. But it doesn't mean they're going to experience it. The chances are they're not going to be let out of prison and and uh, to, to go and for a a trip to, to anywhere. So, so when I say free choice, technically you can choose whatever you want. Um, but it doesn't mean you can experience whatever you want, but just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to say free choice. So we, we don't have free choice on this planet. An example is someone in prison, if someone's in prison. They can't choose to go to the Bahamas. They can't choose to go to, um, you know, Fiji, Hawaii for a few days or the rest of their life, they can't. Someone who is who is paralyzed, 
from the neck down um, or from the waist down. As much as they would like to walk, chances are, no matter how much willpower they muster, no matter how much belief they muster, they're not going to be able to walk in that moment. It doesn't mean they can't walk ever. But what I'm saying is just because they choose it doesn't mean it's going to happen. I cannot ride my bike 500 miles an hour. <laughs> I can only ride my bike 400 miles an hour. No. So, you know, we can't choose whatever we want. So I could go on and on, but you get the point. We don't have free choice. Now, we are evolving as souls through different thresholds of experience. I was going to make an adjustment here with my posture to choose to do that. Um, we are, we are evolving through different thresholds of experience. We are evolving, um, through different successive stages of integrated awareness. And so what we're doing is in a way through these different stages is we're, we're expanding our capacity to make choices. We're mature. We are maturing in one lifetime or through many lifetimes. And in that maturity, we expand our consciousness. And in that expanded consciousness, we expand our range of options. So as we, as we expand our range of options, we expand our available choices. We can make more choices. We can make more empowering choices. Um, we see more possibilities. So this is one way to understand evolution is that we are, we are um, removing or dissolving the illusion of limits that we are here to learn through so that we can realize or actualize our capacity to choose and to create and to recreate ourselves anew every moment. So to evolve, to grow, we, we need limits. We need thresholds of experience. We need to go through stages. We can't just shoot up from zero to mastery. You know, a, a flower goes from seed and then it, it, blossoms and finally pierces the soil and rises up and then blooms. So it goes through stages. It just doesn't in an instant go from seed to full flower. It, it, it goes through these different stages. So it's the same with our own soul evolution. We, we, we do need to go through different stages. So we have to work through the experience, the illusion of limits, because in truth, there are no limits. But we do need to go through the illusion of limits. That's part of, um, that is part of the, the, what we accept, what we agree to by, by coming into form. But part of limits is also the trauma and the programming. It's not just things like having only so much money. It's, or having only so much health. It's also, um, the trauma imprints we have, the program imprints we have which shift our consciousness uh, and and create, you could say, a bit of a deficit consciousness, a lack consciousness, a consciousness where we don't see clearly or feel clearly. And so all of this combined, the, the collective programming as well, it, you know, the, the trauma we inherit from our ancestors, all of this combined creates some form of um, limitation for us. It, it, it narrows our range of choices that we see in any given moment or can choose in any, any given moment. But just because you are experiencing limitation and suffering and pain, whether that be on the level of mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, it doesn't mean you don't have free will. It just means that right now you don't have free choice. 
And it's important to not have free choice. It's, it's important to not have free choice because, because if we could choose anything we want at any given time, there would be no evolution. We'd be done. <laughs> and the truth is, is that there's a strange paradox in that by having less options, by having choices closed off for us, we actually have the opportunity to expand our creativity and thus our range of options. So for example, I used to lead workshops and keynotes and sometimes there'd be a technical problem uh, such as with the projector or there'd be a logistical problem with the way the room is set up, the chairs are arranged, the tables are set up. And and sometimes this would be a challenge that I could not fix. I couldn't have it the way I wanted. Maybe there's a time constraint. Maybe there just wasn't enough staff to help me do it, to arrange things the way I wanted. So I adapted. But in adapting, I discovered something, a new way to lead, a new activity. And I wouldn't have discovered this if there wasn't that limitation in place. So the limitation actually redirected me towards a new possibility, a new choice, more creativity. And so there is a dance, there's a paradox in the sense that limitation creates the space or the tension, dynamic tension for, for expanded creativity. In the same way that our dark night of the soul, where we feel totally abandoned, we feel neither here nor there, we feel lost, confused, alone, powerless. How if we just keep going through that dark night of the soul, we open up to and embody our power in an entirely different way, at an entirely different, at a new level of awareness. So there is this paradox in the sense that limits births creativity or the illusion of limit births creative uh, births creativity and darkness births newfound light so this is something we've agreed to we we have agreed as souls to have these experiences and that's another way to understand free choice or free will is that we may not feel like we chose to have an experience down here maybe we feel like you know, I didn't choose to get cancer, but maybe at a soul level, we chose to have cancer. We wanted to experience cancer. We wanted to experience a particular type of suffering at a soul level. We agreed to it before incarnating. It was part of the divine plan, part of our blueprint for this lifetime. We agreed to it. Beforehand, we chose it. But once incarnated and once 20 years old and once diagnosed, we feel like we're a victim and we feel like life is cruelly, um, you know, forcing this upon us. So that is another perspective is that things that we don't feel like we are choosing, we have chosen already. We have agreed to that already. We do, after all, choose our, our, our mother. We choose the womb we are going to, the womb we are incarnating into. We choose our biological mother. We choose the place of our, um, or the general location of our birth. We, we choose our general environment of birth. We choose the community, the culture, the religious environment, we we arrange a lot of these pieces ahead of time. And when we understand that, when we understand that, heck, maybe I chose or I did choose to be born in a very toxic and abusive home. When we know that, when we take that to heart, it's much harder to cling to victim consciousness. And I'm not saying you shouldn't feel like you've been victimized. I'm not saying you shouldn't feel victim given the hardships that you have experienced. I would never say that to anyone. That would be very uh, uncompassionate. However, what I'm saying is, is that when we take to heart that we chose our birth conditions, our, our, uh, 
the place of birth, our general environment, when we take to heart that that is truth, it is much harder for victim consciousness to stick to us. So, one of the things that I struggled with is that I, I'm a I'm a trained, highly trained uh, healer. I was a registered somatic therapist, a trauma based, attachment based therapist, and I've I experience thousands of hours of work with clients. I do different type of work now. I do online healing and act, and activation ceremonies, but I used to have a thriving practice. I'm a certified breath worker. Before that, I became a certified life coach. So I have lots of experience. And um, one of the things that was really difficult for me and, and was a key contextual piece in my many discussions with the Ascended Masters about free will versus free choice or how much free will we actually have is how much free will can someone actually have or how much capacity for choice can one have if they're operating from a lot of trauma, a lot of programming. They were very abused as children. They were indoctrinated with loads of religious programming. They grew up in a very toxic, oppressive culture. North Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, wherever it might be. How can one have, how can one really choose? Aren't, aren't we all just sort of programmed robots? Now, in my heart of hearts, I knew we weren't automatons. I knew we still had the capacity to choose. But I struggled. And there are different trauma authorities. There are spiritual teachers even who believe we have little to know. And they say free will. They don't say free choice. You might have heard this yourself, trauma authorities or teachers, spiritual teachers who say we don't have much or any free will, but what they're doing is they're conflating free will and free choice. And one reason, uh, well, for the spiritual teacher, they believe this because they see people as being heavily identified with the ego. And for the trauma authority, they believe this because they see human beings as severely dysregulated have ha as having a lot of trauma that overrides instinct, a survival psychobiology that overrides intuition, gut feeling, heart feeling, inner knowing. And I understand that. And that was a big struggle for me when I spoke to the Ascended Masters. I really struggled with that piece. So let me clarify what I learned along with it. I, you know, what I've said so far is partly what I've learned, but I will say this as well. First of all, one of the Ascended Masters I worked with, Kuan Yin, said to me I was too influenced by my trauma training. That's pretty much what she said word for word, is that I had become too influenced. It's like I had become indoctrinated <laughs> to believe that people were far more powerless than they actually are. Spiritual teachers talk so much about the ego, but when, when they speak about the ego, they don't speak about it as um, connected to the higher self. They often don't even say higher self. One of the Ascended Masters I work with is Jesus. And Jesus said to see the ego and the higher self, the multidimensional self, is one harmonious system. One harmonious system. A metaphor I like to use is the hurricane. You have the still eye of the hurricane, which is the still point of our Holy Spirit. And then from that still point, we expand out into increasing chaos, which you could call fear and shame and illusion. So we have the Holy Spirit that is learning and experiencing through fear, shame, limitation, chaos, and confusion. All of that is one harmonious system because it is a harmonious system. If you look at a hurricane, if you look at a tornado, it is actually a beautiful, coherent, intelligent, harmonious system. 
that is a great teacher to us if, if we look at it closely. And so what if we saw our human experience the same way? What if we saw the ego, which is filled with doubts and fears, worrying, anticipation, a lot of illusion. What if we look at that false self as being perfectly woven into, seamlessly woven into the true self? And that there's this beautiful paradoxical meeting place blending between truth and fiction. <laughs> and that we are learning through fiction to remember truth through many experiences, many lifetimes. But just because we're experiencing the intensity of the hurricane doesn't mean we don't have access to the still point of our higher self. Just because we're, we're learning through lies and illusion, a lie, for instance, being that we are unworthy, just because we're learning through the lies and illusion doesn't mean we don't have a higher self who's working with us through that, whispering to us in our heart, in our gut, in our cells, guiding us through that. It's not that our higher self is way up there, separate, and the ego is way down here, which is what spiritual teachers almost, it's almost like they give that impression because of these heavy emphasis they put on ego, ego, ego. What if we thought ego again is harmoniously woven into our multidimensional self? The other piece that I had to accept <laughs> was that, let's use a metaphor here. If you have a dark room and you light a matchstick, that the light of that one matchstick can light up a room. That's how powerful light is. And that's how much of an illusion darkness is. Darkness is illusion because darkness is the absence of light. How can something be truth if it's based in absence? Nothing that's based in absence is truth. So darkness is the absence of light. Lies are the absence of truth. Limitation is, is simply the shadow of infinite possibilities, but we have to work through shadows. So my point is this, is that one little light from that one little matchstick lighting up a dark room, that's how powerful light is. And that's just one little light. Imagine if there were three, five, ten, twenty. Now, keeping that in mind, bring to, see if you can bring to heart and mind how absolutely diaphanous, how absolutely radiant, how absolutely unbounded multi-dimensional, beautiful, stunning, the light of your soul is. It's endless. It's huge. Look at the light of your soul and it's like gazing at a thousand suns. Remember, you're made in the image and likeness of God. So you're just as radiant as God. That's how radiant you are. And we're going to believe that this little ego self that is a false self, that is an illusory self, that is a shadow, that, 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 can, that can veil all of our light, all of that light, all of that light? No, it can't. It can't. No matter how thick the clouds are covering the earth, no matter how thick they are, we are still met with daylight. We can still walk around. We can still see. No matter how thick those clouds are, no matter how many clouds there are, the light of truth still shines through, lighting our way. So it's also the, tr the truth with your higher self, with your oversoul. It simply cannot be blocked out. So anyone, whether it's a trauma therapist, a spiritual teacher, or your own false self, anyone that says to you, you only have a little bit of free will, or you don't have any free will, 
or someone that says you have only a little bit of free choice. I invite you to hold that lightly or toss it in the trash altogether because <laughs> it's false. It's a lie. Truth. Um, the light of truth, that little matchstick, um, has so much more power than the lie of darkness. Lie has got nothing on truth, absolutely nothing. And you are endlessly powerful, endlessly radiant. And yeah, we have to evolve through the shadows. We have to evolve through the illusion of limitation and the illusion of suffering, even though it's not an illusion, because it is very real. If you are depressed, if you are in pain, that's very real. But it's still temporary. It's still temporary. So there's paradox here. There is, um, whenever you start working or integrating absolute with relative, you are, for you to hold them, you need to embrace paradox. <laughs> it's not an either or, it's a both and. And, um, and so what I, I hope this video does for you is dissolve any ideas that you may have that you are powerless even if you have significant trauma, even if you walk around with fear every day, don't forget you have a heart. And your heart is the throne of truth. Truth is in the heart. And that heart speaks. Even in the craziest of hurricane storms in our minds, that heart can be heard. That heart can be heard. My mother and father both grew up with trauma. My dad grew up in wartime Britain. My mother grew up in Switzerland. Somehow, they found each other, met each other in Vancouver, which is where I live now. Somehow, they found each other at the exact perfect moment. If they tell the story, it's quite synchronistic if you heard the story. And um, that was destiny. I'm not going to go into the details about it, but that was destiny. They were meant to meet each other and they were meant to give birth to me. And um, so they have all this trauma programming. They don't go to any yoga studios, Reiki healers, shamans. <laughs> they don't have a meditation practice. And with all that trauma and all that programming, they find each other at the exact perfect divinely appointed moment. So even with all that baggage that we have, we still manage to listen to our heart. We still manage to find our way. Not perfect. There are many, many times when we, when we hear our heart and we don't listen to it. There are many times when we hear our heart and then fear kicks in and doesn't allow us to act on our heart. And a trauma therapist might say, yeah, exactly. That means you're not a choice because fear is overriding instinct. No, just because your, your fear overrides instinct in one area doesn't mean fear overrides instinct in all areas. Let's not get to black and white thinking, which is actually um, the nature of trauma. It's black and white. And trauma therapists have to be careful not to go to black and white. Let's stay in nuance. Just because, I'll say it again, just because your fear and programming override what your heart tells you to do in one area, such as leave your dysfunctional relationship, doesn't mean you can't follow your heart in another area, such as in regards to what to eat or what not to eat. So just because we are not ready to choose something in one area, doesn't mean we're not ready to choose in another area from our heart and higher self. If we're not ready to choose in that area, that means that's a place where we need to bring our attention, where we need to do some healing work, where we need to explore, reflect upon, and, and be vulnerable 
and and courageous in in expanding and growing and growing out of or um, empowering herself through. You get what I'm saying. So, yeah. So I just want to offer that to you because um, I yeah, like I said, I really want us all to feel empowered. I want us all to feel that we we do have the power to choose. And even though you have trauma, even though you have programming, even though you have fear, even though you have a neurotic mind who catastrophizes, even with all of that, the light of your soul is far more powerful than any of that stuff, any of it. And that light never stops shining upon you. The still point in the center of your hurricane never stops breathing life into you. And... And I really encourage you to trust that this is the truth of who you are, even amongst the lies that exist inside and out. So I hope that helps. Thank you for watching, listening. And just so you know, I have some online healing and activation ceremonies coming up this weekend. On Saturday at 3 p.m. Pacific, we work with the Golden Ray on Sunday um, noon Pacific, which is the 14th of January we work with Lord Krishna. So you have a direct transmission from the Golden Ray on Saturday and from Lord Krishna on Sunday, 13th and 14th of January, 77 Canadian and 75 minutes long. I'll put links in the description. Otherwise, please like, share, comment, subscribe, click notifications, and I will see you when I see you. Thank you. Bye.